Louis Armstrong, the great American musical genius. He wears a star of David till the day he dies because he's nurtured by this Russian Jewish family called the Karnovskys. He blows the tin horn on their junk wagon as it goes into different neighborhoods to sell and pick up junk. And one day, Louis Armstrong is staring longingly at this cornet in a secondhand store. And Mr. Karnofsky gives him the money to buy it. And he puts wow. it to his lips and music comes out. Wow. And that is the story of American music. And in my mind, it's the story of America. CEO and co-founder. Joe Dell, the founding partner of ABC. How does a Rhodes Scholar go from a social justice activist to a builder who believes in America? How does someone who sees everything through the lens of race and oppression shift to believing in the American liberal order and working to bring people together from different faith backgrounds to inspire them and to build a better America? Let's ask Ibu. Ibu, thank you very much for joining us today. I am thrilled to be here and I am an American optimist as well, so this is going to be fun. Tell our audience a little bit about your background. Your father immigrated to the U.S. from India, That's I, right. I understand. Tell us a bit about your upbringing. So uh, uh, my dad uh, and my mom both immigrated to the United States from India. We are Ismaili Muslims. It's a small Shia sect of Islam. My dad uh, got his MBA at Notre Dame. That's, that's how we came to this country. And so from the jump, uh, just had a very kind of deep respect for how faith communities build institutions that serve everybody. Uh, my dad was uh, one of the earliest Indian Americans in corporate advertising in the Midwest in the late 1970s and early 1980s. And at some point, just, you know, got tired of that and uh, and became a small business person and, and owned Subway sandwich shops. And so I kind of grew up uh, recognizing that hustle was an essential part of both the American enterprise and, and also part of my faith and part of my heritage and that it was a good thing. It was a good thing to build stuff. How did that hustle tie to your faith and how did the American enterprise tie to your faith? I'm curious. How do those relate to each other? Yeah. So, so you know, the Prophet Muhammad made the peace and blessings of God be upon him. He was a merchant. He was a merchant. And so he, he's unlike, for example, Jesus, who is a revered prophet in Islam. But uh, uh, the, the prophet is, he's, he, before he actually is, uh, receives revelation, he is known as Al-Amin or the reliable. And his first wife was a businesswoman who actually selected him as the person who would uh, um, who would guide her caravans across the deserts and was so impressed by the manner that in which Muhammad did his work that she proposed marriage. And so there's there's this notion, I think it's kind of wow. deep in my identity that the manner in which you do your work really matters. Uh, um, in Islam, there's this beautiful concept called Isan, I-H-S-A-N, which means excellence. And, and, and excellence is beloved of God. Uh, um, and, and so that's just, that's how my parents approach their work. That's how I approach my work, whether as a writer in, uh, of books like We Need to Build or in my work at Interfaith uh, America, uh, which is an organization that believes that the best of our diverse faith traditions shape us into virtuous people. And we ought to be coming together on those shared values of, you know, you, you know, Joe, you write about Tikkun Olam on your website, yep. for example, right? There are similar concepts in Islam like Sadaka. Uh, well, we ought to be guided by those concepts in our faiths and we ought to cooperate on them. I love that. I, I love the idea that we're more allies between our faiths in, in, in many ways in America now, where there's a lot of people who don't have faith anymore. It kind of puts us, it, historically, people would fight over different religions. And it's almost like now we're like more on the same side because what we believe is so related. So. Yeah. You know, and, and, and at Interfaith America, for us, you know, from atheists to Zoroastrians are kind of welcome, right? And the, but the idea is that religion can be a positive force in our society. Uh, um, so, so, um, the only people, the, the only, the only, we, we don't ask people to, to believe in anything uh, uh, related to God or, or or a deity or the supernatural, but we do say, listen, we're going to talk about how religion is a positive force in our society, and and you got to be, you got to come to the table, uh, um, welcoming of that. Yep. that's awesome. So, so you attended University of Illinois, and you got your doctorate in the sociology of religion from Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar. What sparked your interest in, in, in you know, studying religion in Oxford? Uh, so, you know, I grew up um, in an environment where my, my parents were involved in, in the faith in a variety of ways. My mother is, is a much more kind of ritualistic uh, Ismaili Muslim. 
but you know, on a, on a typical Saturday morning, my dad would would leave at nine in the morning and say, "I'm I'm going to help somebody in our Jamaat in our in our Smiley community uh, get their get their driver's license." You know, I'm I'm giving them driving lessons, and that was just kind of it, service was just a part of the faith, right? So I get to college, and there's all of this talk about identity and diversity. This is the early mid 1990s. It's an era that's that's I think of as very similar to our own talk about race and gender and sexuality. And, and you know, I, I, I found it, it kind of it changed my world. And there are dimensions of it that I think are really important. I imagine we'll get into that, Joe. But it's interesting. There was no talk of religion at all, none. And I was doing all of this service and social justice work. And it was kind of a, an anger-based work, right? Like mm-hmm. the people I was running with, they hated the system more than they loved people. Huh. And uh, at, at some point, like I run into somebody who says to me, have you ever heard of Dorothy Day and the Catholic Worker Movement? And I hadn't, uh, but there happened to be a Catholic Worker organization in Champaign-Urbana where I went to school. It's called the House of Hospitality. And I went there, and it was just a totally different experience of service and social justice. It was based on love. It was based on love. It was radical. P- these people lived in solidarity with poor people, uh, um, and they did it because that's how Jesus lived. But there was there wasn't a shred of anger. There wasn't a shred of righteousness. There was mm. just this sense of like we are called to love and lift people up. And I was so taken by that that I actually spent a summer traveling through Catholic worker houses and realizing, you know, I, I'm I don't want to be Catholic, uh, but I'm really moved by the service dimension of all religions. And so I begin to to pay a lot of attention to that I, you know, I read a lot of Abraham Joshua Heschel. I read uh, uh, across different faiths. I have an audience with the Dalai Lama. I, I start to build this idea of an organization of, of, of people from different faiths coming together to serve others. It, the initial mm-hmm. phase of that is Interfaith Youth Corps um, and renamed as Interfaith America about a year ago. And, and when I get to Oxford, I decide, you know, this is what I want to do is study this. What I, what I want to do is study this huge his hugely important dimension of identity, which is religion, which really moves the world in a lot of ways that virtually nobody in my college years was paying attention to. And, you know, my friends at Oxford, they would kind of, they would, they would laugh at me. They would say, you know, th- th- nobody cares about religion anymore, right? Like, like religion is an island in the setting sun. That's a famous yeah. line from Paul Simon's uh, Rhythm of the Saints. And then, of course, September 11th happens. And the notion that religion can have a big impact on the world in a really ugly way becomes very salient. And here I am, like, building this organization that's about religion and religious diversity having a positive impact on the world. And that's really, the, you know, where, where what, at the time, Interfaith Youth Corps gets its first lift. That's amazing. And, you know, you, you wrote a really powerful op-ed in the New York Times also, you know, talking about your time when you, you were talking about how the University of Illinois, you kind of all of a sudden saw a lot of things through these lens you hadn't thought of before in terms of what white supremacy had done to America in a much broader way, right? And so you, it sounds like you started to see the world through the lens of racism and oppression, and it, it became something that maybe dominated too much of your lens, is what you describe. Is there another way out of, of the negativity and the anger, or, or do you need this anger to change things? Like, how do you talk to people who are stuck in where you were, you know? Yeah, I mean, so thank you for that. There's like four questions there. So yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to try to parse this a little bit. I'm going to say, so, so, um, Part of what happens to me in college is, is uh, I mean, I'll just I'll tell you a quick story. So, so um, I go to the gym the first day to play basketball, to play pickup basketball, and there's three games going on. There's three courts. Uh, there's a bunch of black guys playing a game. There's a bunch of white guys playing a game, and there's a bunch of Asian guys playing a game. Literally, like three games going on, and I start to walk towards the game with all the white guys in it. Mm-hmm. And just instinctively. And I I, I kind of, and then I kind of stop myself and I, I, I look at the Asian guys and I think to myself, you know, somebody ought to tell them, like the white guys will let us play. Yeah. And then I, I look again at the Asian guys and I'm like, oh, they want to play with each other. Right? They're not like, they're not like taking second fiddle. Like that's, that's who they want to be. And I think to myself, why did I want to play in the white game? Huh. And then I thought to myself, why have I always wanted to play in the white game? And then I was just like too mentally frozen and I left the gym, you know? 
Yeah. But that's and Joe, you're Jewish, right? Like I, mm. I would imagine that at some point, like some something like that happens to a lot of minorities, which is like, wait a second, I've I've tried to be a part of like this quote unquote dominant culture for a while. And wh- why haven't I been happy with who I am? Whatever that is, right? And I think the My grandma's so I, visiting us right now. She's 102 and she came over here as a one year old. And she yeah, so she I think she had that dynamic more than me. I've always felt kind of like I'm part of things in a diverse society, but the whole history with her side was always, was always like you speak Yiddish in the house, but you speak English out of the house and it's trying to fit in and it's striving to be part of this thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, so listen, p- part of what I want to say is the, the dimension of explore the, the, the exploration of that dynamic. You know, when I tell that story, like, like I'm sensing understanding from you, right? Like, like it is, it is not an alien story. You know, mm. I think the exploration of that is really interesting and important, right? I think the problem is that when I started to explore that, I did it not not uh, um, through multiple perspectives, right? But I, like, I did kind of surgery to my eyes, where all I ever saw was racism, colonialism, oppression, etc. And I never asked myself the question, well, wait a second, you know, I'm at one of the best public universities in the country. That means something. I come from a family that can pay for this education. That means, in other words, no other dimension of my life or the world mattered at all except Mm -hmm. for racism. I think that's the problem. Right. Uh, And I think part of what happened to me is that is that race was never discussed in high school, Mm -hmm. in, in my high school growing up. And so I get to college and it's like it's like total revelation to talk about this. But for whatever reason, I I only I gravitate to talking about it in the most dogmatic ways, and I do think I do see some of that now, and I do think that's a problem. And I want I want to be clear, right? Like I think there are there are so many smart and important ways to talk about race and racism, and we have a lot of great examples of it. And part of what frustrates me about the dogmatic nature of conversations now is. Is they is it's like they're ignoring the very nuanced stuff that a Henry Louis Gates Jr., that a Kwame Anthony Appiah, that a Zadie Smith, uh, mm. uh, that a Wynn Marcellus is like constantly putting out there, right? I mean, there's all kinds of really interesting, nuanced ways to talk about race and racism that is not like hyper dogmatic, uh, um, and 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 I want I want to be a part of that that constructive, positive conversation. One of the things I, I write about is, is, you know, I, my, my, my kids, you know, uh, we're on the North side of Chicago. They go to excellent public schools. They're in a bunch of diversity programs. And my son Zay comes home one day and he says, dad, like, how come only the white kids get to talk about being privileged? <laughs> now think about the phrasing. Think about how smart that phrasing is, right? Yeah. How come only the white kids get to talk about being privileged? Because the conversation in our home about our culture is always a conversation of privilege. You're privileged to have Indian heritage. You're privileged to be in a smiley Muslim. You're privileged to be part of our family legacy, mm-hmm. right? And I, I, it kind of struck me like in all these diversity programs that my, my kids are in, they're like teaching them to hate Islamophobia, which is good, but there, there's nothing about loving Islam. There's yeah, there's nothing, nothing about, about like, the pride in, in, in your background exactly. and your history. Yeah. And, and that just seems like that's like kind of twisted, right? Because hating Islamophobia is not more important than loving Islam. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's very well said. You know, it's it's interesting because there are so many ways to talk about all these things with race. But I, I feel like so I I, I guess you say I'm, I'm Jewish on one side, I'm mostly Irish on the other side. My ancestors got the shit beat out of us for hundreds of years on both sides, but obviously not as much maybe as others did. But I, I guess I'm told I present as white, and so therefore I shouldn't talk about race in America at all because it's too dangerous, and I'm just gonna. It's just not appropriate. Like that's the message I hear because I actually have a lot of thoughts and opinions on it. But I'm like, you know, and, and I have nuanced thoughts, and I, you know, a big part of my Jewish history is fighting for civil rights in my family. We're very involved in that. But but I'm just told, listen, you're not really supposed to weigh in on these things. It's just it's, it's too dangerous. It's gonna get in the way of everything you're trying to do and trying to build. That's kind of been my been my default. Like, you know, I got get in trouble when I say something about it. Like like, like how should we be approaching this? Because it seems like it's so sensitive that it's yeah. it is dangerous. I just you know like I I think we are in a particular moment in which things are supercharged in unhelpful ways, right? But I love watching Henry Louis Gates Jr. on on um and his, on a show on PBS Finding Your Roots, and you notice something. Nobody is ever just white on that show. I'm going to say that again. 
nobody is ever just white. I like that. You're, yeah. you're always from some village in what is now Lithuania, right? Like yeah. you're, you're always, tra- you're, it's like, it's like, what's your story? What's your story? And, and I'll say like, your story is not just interesting to the extent that you were the oppressed or the oppressor, yep. right? Like, like we have to have categories other than oppressed and oppressor. I love that. Uh, uh, in yeah. which to talk about our identities. And, and I, I mean, I think that there's all these beautiful moments in which people from diverse identities partner with each other. So, you know, uh, uh, we're launching something in my organization called the, the Black Jewish Pluralism Partnership. We're, we're calling it the next chapter. And, and part of what we're doing is telling stories like Benny Goodman uh, uh, was had the first integrated swing band, right? And absolutely that has something to do with him being Jewish yep. and having an experience of marginalization yep. and being like, hey, if I see excellence, I want, I, I'm going to have it in my band, right? Louis Armstrong, the great American musical genius, right? The great American musical genius. He wears a star of David till the day he dies because he's nurtured by this Russian Jewish family called the Karnovskys. He blows the tin horn on their junk wagon as it goes into different neighborhoods to sell and pick up junk. And one day, Louis Armstrong is staring longingly at this cornet in a secondhand store, and Mr. Karnovsky gives him the money to buy it. And he puts it to his lips, and music comes out. And that is the story of American music. And in my mind, it's the story of America. And I want to lift, you know, I, I want to lift up the story of like, Louis Armstrong and the Karnovskys being in partnership to make music and to create a civilization, not say, let's talk about how oppressed they both were. They were both oppressed, but isn't the yep. making of music and the building of, of American civilization more beautiful, right? So no, it's so much more so, beautiful and nuanced. You mentioned, I guess you had an African-American professor that helped jolt, jolt you out of the kind of the simplistic ideology. Did you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So, so, you know, this, this uh, professor, like, she didn't even know this, but she changed my life. You know, so, so I, I, I'm taking an independent study with her where I'm reading a bunch of, of critical race theory and other kinds of critical theories, which, by the way, I think is an important perspective. It is an interesting lens to put on, but you shouldn't do surgery to your eyes. So that's all you see. Okay? We so, shouldn't ban these things, we, but we, we need to listen to that. They shouldn't be the only thing we listen to, but it has to be one of the perspectives. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And so I'm reading this stuff and it's useful and it's interesting. Bell Hooks and Powell Frary and others, right? Uh, um, and, and basically what I am gathering from this, and this is like a very adolescent thing, right? I'm reading this as a 20 year old. This is not how she's guiding me, but I'm reading this as a 20 year old. And basically what I'm gathering is the way you change the world is you tell other people what they're doing wrong. Okay. It's an supremely adolescent approach to things. <laughs> so uh, she's a professor of theater. And, and education, and and she's putting up putting together a play with uh, um, with her graduate students, and she invites me to come to the dress rehearsal. And I actually bring a class full of kids with me. It's a, it's a play about kids. I bring a class full of kids. So they do this play, and there's a scene in the play of uh, of a, a kid having going back to his own room and like processing, you know, a fight with a parent or something like that, uh, um, and. The, the performance is over and it's because it's a dress rehearsal. There's kind of a talk back and Q and a session. And I stand up and I just light into the cast who are a bunch of like 20 something. So graduate students, right. Mm. About how classist and how racist it is to have a kid with a single with, with his own room. And how does it feel for kids who don't have their own room? And, you know, like I go on for three, four five minutes and like this cast is the first time they perform this. Right. They've written this play. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they're looking at me like they have like, like, like what is going on? And the rest of the audience is just stone cold silent. And like, after I sit down, there is just dead silence. And then my professor was like, you know, the event is over and that was it. Wow. Right. So like, I'm feeling kind of weird about what's happened. Not really, you know, I'm, I'm kind of like, you know, was I, did I pull a Stokely Carmichael? Did I like, did I like, you know, did I like uh, 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 raise a righteous fist at the man or, but it was kind of uncomfortable. A couple of days later, I get this email from my professor and she's like, why did you choose to approach it that way? You know, like, do you have any idea what it's like to write a play and then to perform it and to like be trying to do something good in the world? And she's like, you know, you, you should, uh, um, 
you should try to create something, right? Like creating something yeah. is always harder than criticizing. And, and this is at the end of my college years. Uh, it's like May of my final year in college. And I think on that for a long time. And that like that moment is very important to me. Like, do I want to be the person telling other people what they're doing wrong? Or do I want to be the person building something better? It's actually one of the things I admire about the business world. You know, if Steve Jobs was like, the Sony Walkman sucks. Sony Discman <laughs> sucks. But I'm not yeah. going to write an article about how much it sucks. I'm just going to build the iPod. You know, yeah. I'm just going to build something better. And that's how we try to run our organization at Interfaith America. Like, like I'm not going to try to tell you everything you're doing wrong. I'm just going to try to build something better. You know, I'm a builder. We're always creating companies to fix problems. That's, that's, that's our whole framework. But what's the right way to teach about the broken things in America's past? Like, how do we recognize sins and maybe also virtues in a way that moves us forward? Because, you know, I was, I was having some chats in Atlanta with some, some African-American leaders, and we do a lot there in the civil rights area. And, and, a, and a couple of them like, you know, maybe it's better just never to talk about it because we're always going to, everyone's going to disagree and we're going to fight over it and just focus on the future. But I mean, I mean, should we be talking about the past still on these issues? Like, like how, how do we approach these things? I think that's a great question. So, so I would say the single most important thing in bringing me out of, of, of just being a, 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 a total critic of the American past, I, I think there's two things. One is, is, is religion, and the other is the African-American tradition, which, of course, is, is woven in with religion, right? And, and you know, so you read Baldwin, you read King, you read Frederick Douglass, and you, and, and you kind of realize, like, wait a second, the people who had every right to call America a lie instead called America a broken promise and said it's worth fixing. I love that about and those so, characters. They really believe in the principles behind this country, yeah. you know? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, if you, you know, if you read Frederick Douglass's What to the Slave is the Fourth of July, it, it is it is unabashed about the critique. And then it ends with the sentence. And I believe in our uh, in the genius of American principles and the genius of our the greatness of American principles and the genius of our institutions. Right. And so I kind of think to myself, like, like. If, if, if that was Frederick Douglass's orientation and if that was King's orientation, and King, his first speech of the Montgomery bus boycott is, you know, we are not wrong because if we are wrong, the Bible is wrong. We are not wrong because if we are wrong, the Constitution is wrong. I mean, here's a guy who's quoting the Constitution, yeah. right? Baldwin talks about achieving our country. And so I just think to myself, like, if they could believe and work for it, I just, it feels to me deeply disrespectful for me, for an immigrant who has just benefited tremendously from being in this country, right? For me to, uh, for me to, to not pick up uh, from the hope that they led with and kind of run my part of the race. So, so if, if I were to analyze some of your philosophy and frameworks, uh, it, it feels a little bit like because, maybe because you have such a strong religious view of the world uh, and, and, and you have such a strong faith, you're not fully adopting something that feels a little bit religious, which is this kind of like philosophical nihilism that's kind of come and taken over a lot of our universities, right? Because I think there is something religious almost for some, for, at least it seems to me that way, and you tell me, but it seems to me like a lot of this Foucault and Derrida framework that d believes in the impotence of reason, believes that all the constitution and everything we did was all zero sum imposing our power on someone else. Like they kind of look at the past through like one group imposing its power on another. And they're teaching, I think millions of our kids, this framework right now, I think this is our cultural framework that a lot of people have. We're very angry. And it's almost like you're rejecting that. And I, I agree with that very strongly. I think millions of people don't at this point. Like, like, like how do we have that debate or yeah. discussion? So I, th I think there's a couple of things here, Joe. So one is, um, um, I, I absolutely agree. And, Lots of smart people, including you, like Ross Douthat has said this and others have said, like, like basically, there's always going to be the same amount of religion in a society. And, a, and, and, and if it's not going to be a historic world faith, it's going to be a political ideology, right? <laughs> or it's going to be like a kind of a cultural phenomenon. Like, I, I, think that that, I, think that, I think that the manner in which, whatever you want to call it, wokeness or anti-racism intersectionality, the, the, the fervor in which it is believed in is religious in nature, yeah. right? Now, I, I want to continue to underscore that there are important truths 
important dynamics in the world that these perspectives illuminate. Yep. They are useful perspectives. They are useful perspectives, right? The the the, the problem, you know, the the way I, I put this in uh, um, in my book, we need to build is anti racism is a useful critique of the world. It is dangerous as a paradigm, right? Because it just doesn't explain the it doesn't it doesn't explain enough of the world, and yeah. that's what a paradigm is supposed to do. And it's really terrible as a regime. It's really terrible when it has coercive power when it is punitive power yep. right when uh people who follow th that paradigm are able to to get rid of professors at, at colleges right and so i want to maintain these perspectives as useful critiques i want to say they're not useful paradigms and they're deeply dangerous as a machine uh, uh but i do think that 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 the fact that uh, um, you know I have a I have a, a religion that I understand is it was a, my interpretation of it is enormously forward looking and and that's where kind of my emotional energy goes that really, that's really important but really like my critique of anti racism as a paradigm right not as a critique as a critique it's useful as a paradigm it's not my critique of it is based on Western liberal principles it's not based mm -hmm. on Islamic principles mm -hmm. it's based on like hey wait a second uh, the 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 framework doesn't match the data yep. Right. Like the framework doesn't match the data. And that is like a it's, it's not like that's that is. I mean, that, that's very much within the Islamic framework as well. I mean, Islam is pioneering in science mm -hmm. uh, uh, in, the, in the Middle Ages. But it, it is it is out of the mindset of like intellectual principles that I learned at university in a graduate school uh, that I'm like very uh, um uh, whatever the word is, like I'm very kind of concerned about the manner in which people are using a set of perspectives, not as lenses, but as dogmas, as paradigms and not as critiques. Yeah, so when it becomes a dogma, it's dangerous. When it becomes a perspective, it's very helpful to all of us. How do we- Exactly. How, exactly. Do, we, how do we push? So, so, you know, we're starting, I'm one of the founders of UATX. We're starting a new university, which is you know, trying to, you know, pursue reason in ways that are different than what we see happening in some of the other universities. We have a lot of great people involved. What approach would you take to try to bring back the conversation and debate around these things? Because, I mean, for example, with anti-racism, as, as interpreted by Ibram X. Kendi, you know, you know, there's all these things you're just not allowed to debate. You're not allowed to discuss. You're like, how do we get these discussions and debates happening again? How do we get people not canceled to talk about these things? Yeah. So, I mean, I think part of what it, it's a little bit of my, my, uh, uh, my point earlier, and by the way, like I, you know, like I admire Barry Weiss, and and, and I think she brings a useful perspective. I'd love to be in a conversation with her at some point, mm -hmm. uh, and I appreciate what what the institution you're, you're building is doing. Um, and I, I think of it as another perspective on the landscape, right? And and as long as, in my view, the more perspectives, the better within lines of basic decency, right? So anti-Semitism, anti-Holocaust. Uh, uh, Holocaust denial is not a perspective, right? That's just yeah. hatred. And and burn it down nihilism is not a perspective. That that's just hatred. Also, like within bounds of basic decency, which is pretty wide. Yeah. I think we should. I think we should be talking about these. There's a there's a there's an insight I think you'll appreciate, uh, um, which is uh, um, John Courtney Murray, the great Catholic philosopher, says a civilization is defined by people living and talking together. Right. A, a civilization is defined by people living and talking. Together. So the quality of our conversation, the manner in which we talk with one another, that, that's the quality of our civilization. And if we cannot explore topics in ways guided by evidence, reason, multiple perspectives, et cetera, et cetera, we we have a problem. Right. We have a problem. Uh, um, and, you know, some of my favorite art in the world is is uh indian miniatures of the the court of akbar the great i don't know if you're familiar with these you're familiar with your, your i don't, know, I don't you know these miniatures with... tell us about them so 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 just google like uh uh, uh um paintings of akbar the great right and and what you'll see is this court in in the 16th century in india of people from different religions talking to each other and i i love those images right because, I mean, I'm an Indian Muslim. This is like in my heritage, there are these, there's this beautiful art 
of people talking to building a civilization. And I think that that's such a special thing about America. Um, and I, you know, so how do we do that? I mean, part of what I want to do is, is, is like lift up the voices of people who do that really well already and, and are not like haters, you know, yeah, no, I, 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 I love that haters. about, I love that about a lot of the great Islamic civilizations is they would bring together the people of different faiths to talk and to be part of the conversations. Yeah. They, they so, you know, I was, I was talking to, I was talking to a Turkish Muslim yesterday, Turkish American Muslim yesterday. He said to me, you know, when, when the Jews got kicked out of Spain in 1492, they didn't just come to the Ottoman empire. Okay. The Ottoman, the, the, the Ottoman Sultan sent ships to pick the Jews up. Yeah. That's a, such a beautiful story. No, that's awesome. Right? Yeah. That's such a beautiful, like we should know that about each other. Like we should know this beautiful history of, collaboration and, and, and cooperation. One of the so, stories in our family too, you know, on my, on my dad's side, which is mostly Irish, is when the English, it was starving and there was genocide going on and the English wouldn't help. Uh, the Ottoman Sultan wanted to send money and the queen wouldn't let him and Queen Elizabeth wouldn't let him the first. And then, so he said he sent a bunch of food on ships for free and he bailed out. And, you know, it, even, even a few hundred years later, members including including people you know tied you know tied to me refused to fight against the Ottoman Empire in, in a war. <laughs> a few hundred years later, I remembered how they'd been saved by them. From from Ireland. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that these are wonderful stories, right? And and I, there's so much. I think part of what I find so just frustrating about our current moment is the stories that we're sharing now. They are not encouraged to be shared because the first thing somebody wants to hear about you is how have you been oppressed by other people or how have you oppressed other people? Not how in your heritage are there beautiful stories of cooperation and collaboration, right? And and that's. Like it's, it, you know, it, I, I like to say, if the only thing you're paying attention to is the elephant in the room, you're missing all the other animals in the zoo. I, I love you that. I, I want to ask you a little bit more about your book, uh, We Need to Build. Uh, you know, a lot of young people go through school and college without building anything. I think you had that you had a realization right at the end of, of university that maybe you wanted to be a builder. Like, how do we change that culturally? How do we form institutions to get people to build more? Is that something you've, you've thought about? Yeah. Well, you know, that, it's a huge part of what my organization, Interfaith America, does. Like, like, what, like what, we're, what we do is we bring together students in interfaith leadership trainings. So we have these massive interfaith leadership institutes and we have online trainings. And then we give them mini grants to launch interfaith projects. It can be a service project. It can be a podcast. It can be an art exhibit. It can be teaching a, teaching a, a module and a course. But it's basically we're, we want you to learn something about interfaith history. So, you know, here, here are a couple of examples, Louis Armstrong and the Karnofskis, Benny Goodman and his integrated band, King and Heschel, whatever it might be. And we want you to like do your part now. And so I think, I think, you know, I'm, I'm a, uh, um, I'm a big fan of social entrepreneurship. I'm an Ashoka fellow. Uh, uh, and, and we very much take that approach in, in, in my organization. And, you know, it's funny, I, I, had, a, I had a toe in the Obama administration. Uh, and at that time, the kind of, this kind of approach was was very much part of the norm, and now it's kind of very much on the margins. But but I'm mm -hmm. I'm I'm really hopeful that people who whose belief is like, hey, just build something better, just yeah. build something better, that that there is enough of a groundswell of those folks from a variety of political stripes. And part of part of what I read on your on your website, Joe, is you're like you're government agnostic, and I love that, yep. right? Like I'm going to find ways to work with you. Uh, unless you're, unless you're, you know, unless you're a, a, a hateful anarchist or a hateful fascist, I'm going to find ways to work with you. You know, I love it. And so, you know, obviously a challenge to interfaith America is a religious affiliation in the U S is seems to be declining rapidly, at least from, from what I understand. Are we, are we in the verge of like most of society being post-religious? Does that impact your work? Are there other ways you see religions being on the upswing again here? Yeah. So, so, you know, if you, if you read uh, like American Grace by Robert Putnam and David Campbell, you, you'll see that over the, you know, they, they, they look at really religiosity over the past century. And, and it just, it goes like this. It, it like, it, there's like spike, there's like, there's, there, there's peaks and valleys. So 1957, something like 80% of people said religion was very important in America. 1967, something like 13% said it was very important. Wow. 1977, it's back up to the mid fifties, right? 1967 is the summer of love. It's like, you know, the height of the Vietnam war, uh, the cultural revolution. 10 years later, religiosity is back up. You know, right? I, I want to so observe that's really fascinating because right now we're at a low point, I think. And also there was a recent poll 
Only 16% of Gen Z adults said they're proud to live in America. It seems like people being unhappy with America and religious affiliation being low for whatever reason seem to be correlated culturally. Is that is, is that a real thing? I, 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 do, I do find that interesting. I do find that interesting. You know, you know, uh, um, if you listen to Robert Putnam and Robbie Jones from the Public Religion Research Institute, and they're both friends of mine, people I admire a lot, they'll say that part of this was like, the the kind of the manner uh, in which the the religious right was kind of hateful in the 1980s and early 1990s. Yeah. You know, by the way, note I said religious right and not American evangelicalism because there's a lot of American evangelicalism that's really positive. Yeah. Even parts that I disagree with, I think has a net positive impact on the culture. Right. So I think a Rick Warren. Uh, and a Joel Hunter are very different figures. They're central to American evangelicalism, but they're not religious right figures, you know? So part of what part of what the, these folks think is, is there was a backlash against the religious right, uh, um, uh, you know, from, from the 80s and 90s, and there's been a decline ever since. There's probably a lot of truth to that. My hope is that, um, I, I think it's gonna get a little worse before it gets better because at this point, religious leaders, pastors are just burned out. Mm -hmm. They're just burned out. Like like the the storm at the intersection of Trumpist racism mm -hmm. and leftist resistance, it's it like rocks churches. It's, just, it's exhausting right? for it, yeah, that makes sense. It's exhausting. It's and I really feel for those pastors. But you know, I, I think that America is at a molten moment and and People who have, I, I like to call it moderate temperaments. You know, Dave, David Brooks once said to me, it's one of the greatest compliments I ever get. He heard me speak somewhere and he said, you know, you call yourself a moderate. You're not actually moderate substantively, but you have a moderate temperament. And that, yeah, I think that that's a, a great compliment. And actually, uh, I'll connect this back to, to Islam. Uh, when the Prophet Muhammad went on his night journey uh, um, uh, from the Dome of the Rock to, to, to heaven, uh, the angels presented him with three drinks, wine, water, and milk, and he drank the milk. And the symbolism is that he chose the middle path, middle path. right? And I, I kind of love that, right? And I actually think that, I'm curious what you think of this, Joe. I think that human beings, we are naturally moderate, like we are made to be moderate. And so we're in an extreme moment right now, but I don't think we are made to be able to um, to be able to maintain extremes for long periods of time. I think that's right. I worry there's cultural forces and technological forces with how social media works, you know, that are pushing us to, to go into these more extreme things right now. And, and I think we have to figure out how to overcome that. I think a lot of people, there are a lot of people at this place right now where they're, where they're primed to fight and primed to push back against you. And, and, you know, I've seen it happen to a lot of my, a lot of my friends on both sides where people try to cancel them in ways that they wouldn't have done 10 years yeah. ago, you know? Yeah. But, yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you a story, which was very influential for me. So, so uh, I remember seeing Cornell West on C-SPAN uh, like 10 or 12 years ago. And this guy calls in, it's a call-in show, this guy calls in and is like, you know, I disagree with everything about you politically, everything. And then he says, but I love jazz. And I love that you're such a jazz fan. And Cornell West is like, let's talk about jazz, brother. Let's talk about jazz. <laughs> I, I just thought it was the most beautiful moment, right? Because because Cornell West is basically, and you know, Cornell West is a man of the left, right? Cornell yeah. West is basically saying, hey, I, I want to I want to start with you on a, I want to start with you where we we can have a mutually enriching conversation. And I, just, it was like instinctive for him, you know. Yep. And I just like like that's again, unless you're a Holocaust denier or like a you know a burn it down. Uh, uh, anarchist. I want to find ways to talk. Yeah, to this you was, this was the whole Frederick Douglass thing. It's amazing. Someone born as a slave and went through what he went through. He said, "I'll work with anyone to do good." I want to end on uh, asking you about optimism for the future. You know, we started American Optimist to try to push back on a lot of the cynicism and yeah. pessimism we're seeing in our country. Uh, and you know, you're, you're you're kind of have a really strong viewpoint of what's going on. You know, in the in these faith areas and the, you know, these people who are having a tough time. What are the best reasons to be optimistic about our country in the next ten or twenty years? Yeah, uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna. It'll give you a couple of things. So, so no. So I'm gonna give I'm gonna give you two or three things on that. Okay. So, so so you know, I look at a glass that's like partially full, right? And I think to myself, boy, somebody created that glass. Somebody like put liquid in that glass. Like there's these generations of people who come before me who've done all this work so that I could be where I am. What's my what's what's my role, right? So it's kind of a Burkean conservatism, right? It's kind of a sense of like like you you owe things to the past, right? There's a great line by T.S. Eliot, uh, we do not inherit traditions, we work to make ourselves worthy of them, right? So mm -hmm. so I, I come from that, I come from that mindset. I think, I think that that is, that is, 
there is something related to religiosity in that mindset, right? Because, you know, part of a huge part of religion is like you are carrying on the practices of the past. There's a beautiful story in Islam. The prophet Muhammad says, if you have a, if you have a sapling in your hand and, 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 and the world is going to end, plant the sapling, you know, like, yeah. be, and that's like, a, that's like, like, that's a believer kind yeah. of thing, you know? And the other thing is like, I mean, you look around you every, every direction you look, there are people who have it harder than you, right? So I was just in Mexico. I was just in a little beach town in Mexico. There was like eight-year-old indigenous kids selling chiclets on the street. Yeah. And like they're happy with five pesos. And there's a, there is almost nothing that that kid can do. I mean, it's the saddest thing in the world. There is virtually nothing that kid can do to dramatically transform his place in life, Right. And I just think to myself, if you are not that eight-year-old kid selling chiclets, you know, if you're not like a leprous beggar on the streets of India, if you're not in an asbestos-filled shack in Soweto, if you're not a rag picker uh, on trash mountains outside of Nairobi, and I have seen all of these figures, right? If you are something other than that, like if you're not a conscripted Russian soldier, sitting in a tank somewhere thinking what the hell happened or or like a ukrainian in, in kiev in the apartment building next to the one where 45 people died thinking what happened you should just like be grateful and 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 use your agency to improve your life and the lives and the lives of others and, and to build well, well that's a great note to end on Ibu. i really appreciate it it's very inspiring yeah thank you joe